So today we're going to be looking at severe to profound hearing losses. As we know, 1.6 billion people around the world have a hearing loss. And we've also seen this week that the majority of these suffer from a mild to moderate degree of hearing loss. But we're going to talk today about the population, a small but significant part of this, which suffer from severe to profound hearing loss. And here we can see that the distribution between severe and profound hearing loss is roughly equal. If we go again to the literature and look at the prevalence of this condition, we can see that with overall hearing, we see at birth around one per 1,000 babies being diagnosed with a hearing loss. And as the child gets older, this increases to around 1.5 in every 1,000 children suffering from some degree of hearing loss. If we look at the trajectories, then we can see that the children with moderate hearing loss follow a similar trajectory to the overall pattern. However, the severe to profound hearing losses look a little bit different. We can see that in these cases, the majority are born with this condition, and then there's not significant increases in severe to profound hearing losses as the child gets older. Therefore, it's essential that we have access to tools to diagnose these hearing losses at the earliest stage as possible. There's been countless reports in the literature that early diagnosis leads to improved patient outcomes regarding speech, quality of life, education level and employment level. Newborn hearing screening has really helped us identify these severe to profound hearing losses and today we're going to look at how we can use the auditory brainstem response and also the auditory steady state response to get frequency specific information so we can make the correct diagnostic decisions and also the correct rehabilitation decisions for these patients. If we look at the causes of severe to profound hearing losses, then we can see that there's multiple causes. There's genetic causes such as Usher's syndrome. There's infectious causes during pregnancy such as CMV. We also have hypoxia or lack of oxygen during the birth, low birth rate, jaundice and infections such as meningitis. When we look at these causes then it's important to remember that these children often suffer from additional problems in addition to their hearing loss. These could be visual problems such as in Usher syndrome, speech problems or speech delay, cognitive issues as well as motor skill issues. An important consideration that we must take into consideration with this population is also their vestibular function. As we know, these children can often suffer from a global inner ear abnormality or damage. Therefore, it would be a mistake if we did not assess vestibular function in these children and if an abnormality is detected, support their development for appropriate rehabilitation. If we look at a group of severe to profound hearing losses which were fitted with cochlear implants, then we can see the distribution of the causes of the hearing loss. We can see that genetic causes contribute to the largest amount, followed by syndromic. Then we have infections. And it's also important to note that 15% of children that were fitted with cochlear implants in this study, there was an unknown cause again reinforcing the importance of newborn hearing screening so that we can detect these babies as soon as possible. Once a hearing loss has been detected then of course it's important that we provide appropriate rehabilitation options. The first step in this journey is often a hearing aid. However it's important to recognize that the cochlear characteristics in these children can be different from the other populations that we've looked at so far this week. It's important to remember that the nonlinear amplification of the outer hair cells is around 70 dB, whereas these children often have hearing losses which is greater than this value. This means that there's usually a problem in other structures of the cochlea. This could be the inner hair cells, it could be the synaptic junction, or we could even have retrocochlear issues on the auditory nerve. 
all this contributes to a situation where applying amplification using hearing aids, these children often get a reduced benefit compared to the other groups that we've looked at this week. And therefore, we also need to look at other treatment options, such as cochlear implants and brainstem implants. So for the rest of today, we're going to look at the five challenges which I've identified in this presentation. We're firstly going to look at how we can use electrophysiological measurements to diagnose frequency specific information in these children at the earliest point in the child's life. We're then going to address how we consider programming a hearing aid and what we need to be aware of when fitting instruments to these children. We also then need to explore the role of cochlear implants and when should you refer for a cochlear implant. And lastly, we're going to tackle the question that often goes unanswered, which is looking at the vestibular function in these children and asking the question, do these children suffer from vestibular issues?